Uh, so uh, thanks for uh, Blockchain Academy for having me. Uh, my name is Itai, Itai Radotsky. I am the CTO and uh, co-founder of Portis. Portis is a platform uh, which enables uh, an easier way to interact with decentralized applications. Applications that runs on the on blockchain. Uh, today we will uh, talk about uh, some uh, um, uh, attacks and vulnerabilities in Ethereum. So this talk is based on uh, on a paper, an academic paper, and I have a link below, so you will have the slides, so you can uh, read it after. Uh, so we will start with uh, fundamentals on Ethereum, and then we will uh, uh, go over some uh, vulnerabilities, and uh, to uh, and at the end we will see actual attacks. All right. So uh, the uh, the core concept, uh, the core uh, component in Ethereum, is smart contracts. Uh, does any, anybody here know what uh, what is a smart smart contract? All right, no, not a lot. So uh, to make things uh, simple, smart contract is a code, and this code is used when we have some parties, two or more, that not trust each other, and uh, this smart contract, this code rely on the uh, mechanism of consensus in blockchain in order to uh, uh, remove the, the trust from the system. Uh, so maybe you heard about uh, the execution fees or transaction fees, right? So th this is the, the fees that we have to pay for, this, for the network in order to invoke the transactions. As I said before, uh, smart contracts are just uh, code. So we have functions and we want to invoke those functions. And in order to do that, we need to pay for the network. There, there are no free launches. Uh, so the, the execution fees is part of the incentives that miners get. Those miners actually take uh, the smart contract, take the code, and run the functions that we want to invoke. Uh, the, uh, those uh, transactions, uh, the functions, are uh, also bound by the execution fees. So when we uh, send a transaction, we also need to tell the network how much fees do we want to pay. And we do that with uh, uh, gas and gas price. So gas, uh, also known as gas limit, is just a number, and the gas price is a price for each gas unit in ether. Uh, also, those uh, those execution fees prevent for denial of service attacks. Uh, so we we will start with looking at a uh, simple contract. Uh, this contract is wrote in uh, Solidity. Solidity is the uh, high-level programming language in Ethereum. So as you can see, we have uh, a contract, a really simple contract. And uh, the syntax in Solidity is uh, very familiar with JavaScript. So uh, we will see more examples of code later on. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you, you will get the point, even if you don't know Solidity. Uh, I just want to... Um, uh, explain three um, built-in functions in Ethereum. So the first one is send. Send is used to transfer Ether from contract to someone. Uh, the second one is call. Call invokes a function on a, simple, on a, on a contract and transfer Ether. The last one is delegate call which is similar to call. However, the, uh, uh, the environment is the, uh, the call environment. So if I will use this, this will be referred to the call and not to the contract. This is not so important, just 
to know that uh, we have those three functions uh, and we will use it later on. Uh, in addition, in, uh, in Ethereum, in Solidity, uh, we have uh, something that's called function signature. So function sig signature is uh, declared by the four first bytes of the SHA-3 of the signature of the function. So we take a string, uh, which is the name of the function and the list of the arguments. Uh, we apply SHA-3, uh, hash uh, uh, function, and we take the four first bytes. And we are using it in order to uh, invoke function when we use call and delegate call. Also, not so important, but we, we will use it. Uh, so let's start with the vulnerabilities. The first, the first one is call to the unknown. So in Ethereum, we have uh, a pattern uh, which uh, declare um, an address. And this pattern can, can be either a wallet address or a contract address. And you cannot know if, uh, if this address belongs to a contract or a wallet not without using uh, Ethereum. So here we see a, a simple uh, code uh, in Solidity that declares uh, an address, a variable of kind address uh, called Bob address, and then try to send some amount of ether or way uh, to this address. So if this address belongs to a wallet, everything works fine. Right, that the, this amount of ether will be transferred to uh, Bob address, and nothing, nothing else will happen. However, if this address belongs to contract, in addition to the amount of ether that will be transferred to to the contract, the default function will be invoked, and the default function is declared to be a function which has no name and no arguments. So if, you, if we have a contract, which has a default function, and we use the send uh, method in order to transfer ether, we will transfer the ether, the amount of ether that we wanted, and in addition, we will invoke the default function. Uh, the same happened with uh, a call and delegate call. The second vulnerability is exception disorder. Uh, in Ethereum, we have two cases for exceptions. The first one is out of gas. As I said before, when we uh, send a transaction to the Ethereum network, we also need to uh, specify what is the uh, gas amount that we want to pay. And if uh, the function that we want to invoke has more instructions that uh, consume more gas than we want to pay, the miner will throw an exception and we have a rollback. The second option for exception is using one of, uh, of the three uh, functions, revert, require, or assert. Yeah, we have a question? Yeah. I can hear you. So the wallet, is he separate? Is he a contract or is he a separate first class feature? Can you repeat? The wallet, yeah. is he a contract, a kind of contract, or a separate first class feature of the wallet? Uh, a separate. It's, uh, it's not a contract at all. Good question. Uh, OK, so here we see uh, a contract, uh, Bob, which has a function Pong and a local variable X and x uh, set to zero, and after we will invoke, uh, invoke pong, x will be set to one, then we will invoke a uh, ping function uh, that's declaring Alice contract, and after that we will set x to be equal to two. If ping uh, Alice function will, uh, will uh, raise an error, we will have a full rollback, and x will be set to zero. However, if we will use call or delegate call, 
and ping function, Alice ping function will raise an error, we will not have a rollback. This, uh, this call will return false, and x will be equal to 2. Okay, the, the third uh, vulnerability is typecast. So like in every, uh, like most uh, high-level uh, languages, we have uh, typecast, uh, also in Solidity. And here we see uh, on the right, contract Bob, which had a function Pong, uh, which had one argument uh, named C uh, of a kind Alice. And hope. And uh, we try to uh, to cast C to type Alice and use the function uh, ping. So here we, we can have three different scenarios. The first one is that C that we get from outside of the contract, uh, let's say from a user, is uh, an address, but it's not a contract address. It's a wallet address. The second scenario is that C is an address of a contract, and this contract actually has a ping function, but it can be with whatever implementation not related to the real Alice implementation. The third scenario is that uh, C is a contract which uh, with no function ping. And in all those three scenarios, we will have no error. And we cannot know in which one uh, are we. All right, so uh, this is a really uh, interesting vulnerability, the re-entrancy. Uh, and here we have a contract to Bob which has a local variable sent, a boolean variable, uh, which is set to false, and the ping function, which has one argument of kind address, and ping function check if uh, sent is false, and then send two-way, which is the smallest amount of uh, ether, uh, to this address, to C, and after that, set sent to be true. All right, so what is the problem here? Let's see, so we can deploy a contract, Bellary, which has a default function. Default function is a function that has no name and no arguments. And this default function will declare uh, an instance of kind Bob and call Bob ping function. So le let's see what, what is the problem here. So uh, I, I am the owner of uh, Mallory, and I want to exploit the contract to Bob. What, uh, what do you think that I should do? No ideas? OK. So. Uh, if I will call uh, uh, Bob's ping function with the address of Mallory, with the address of the contract of Mallory, then we will uh, go inside ping, send is still false, we will uh, call with two-way to Mallory, and because uh, we use call, we will enter to the default function, as we saw before, and the default function will declare an instance of type Bob and will call ping function again. So we, we will be at, uh, at the line of uh, C call value 2, and we will repeat recursively until we reach the uh, stack limit, or until uh, uh, we will reach uh, out of gas, or will, uh, Bob will have, uh, will have no uh, uh, ether in his balance. 
All right, keeping secrets. Um, this, yeah. Uh, I, I don't hear you. But it's not revert though necessarily. Like once once the gas runs out, that because it's an infinite loop, wouldn't it always uh, run out of gas and then revert? Like, wouldn't Mallory have to check if Bob was about to run out before trying to exploit? Uh, so uh, if if we will get an out of er out of gas error, uh, we will get. Uh, because uh, because call doesn't propagate errors, we will get all the money except the last call. What if we try to do the C dot? C dot the call. I, I can't hear you. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Then it would revert. Again? If we didn't have dot call in there, then it would revert and it would fail. Right. If if we would use transfer, then we wouldn't have this problem at all. Because re-entrance re is uh, not relevant in transfer. Only in call and delegate call. Just one thing. <laughs> Questions into the mic so we can get them on video. Okay? It's important that you will hear it. Yeah. It's a lot more important than the video will get. Okay? Thank you. All right. So keeping secrets. Uh, it's not a real uh, vulnerability, but uh, it's uh, kind of funny. Um, so in Solidity, we also have uh, public and private uh, for uh, local parameters, for local uh, variables. And uh, it doesn't mean that if we declare uh, a variable to be private, it's really private. Because as we all know, the blockchain is public. So in this case, if I would uh, ask for a contract A, for the value of age, I will get it. If I will ask for uh, the value of year, I will get an error. However, if I will trace back all the transactions that was sent to contract A, I can calculate by myself the value of year. So there, there are no secrets. How do you do that? How do you calculate the value of year? Uh, if you if you have the code, yeah. Yeah. Um, the question is, how you can calculate the value of year All by right. looking at different uh, previous tr transactions? Okay. Good question. So all the transactions on the blockchain are public to everyone, and if we have those transactions, we can see the arguments that was sent to the contract, and in addition, we can see the code of the contract, so we can run a small script, just calculate the uh, value of the variable. OK? Uh, <laughs> OK, so uh, we'll continue after it. Uh, one last thing. Excuse uh, me? Yeah. On the last slide, yeah. uh, using something that you described earlier with a cast, I create another class, another contract B, mm -hmm. having both members public, mm -hmm. cast the address of A into B, and then have a public method of B to get the year. Uh, can you repeat? I create another class B. Okay, with another, the same another sig contract. Another contract, sorry. Okay. Another contract with the same signature as uh, A, okay. except that I put public. Now okay. I have, and I cast the address into B, and now I have. A method that I uh, can call and uh, get the value of a yeah, but public field. Uh, yeah, but this value will be uh, the value in contract B and not A. No, I take A address, mm -hmm. I cast it oh, into B. Okay. Now I can cast, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I, and I get a member. It's a public member on the class B. Yeah, so other. this is identical to take the code and run a script which calculates the, the value. The, okay. Yeah, it's easier way to do it. But the, the point is that nothing is a uh, secret on contracts. OK? And one last thing, uh, immutable bugs. So if we have a bug or vulnerability in our contract, uh, we cannot change it. The only thing that we can do is fix it and deploy a new contract. And this contract will have a new address. So this is a really important thing to know. 
And now we will dig in the actual attacks. And the first one, and the most uh, famous, is the, the DAO attack. Uh, the DAO is the uh, decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, and this is uh, like one of the most uh, famous, this is one of the most famous uh, projects in Ethereum. And uh, it made a lot of uh, a sound. And it also uh, attacked, uh, and a lot of money uh, was still from the contract. So we will not get into their politics uh, that the, the DAO uh, um, contract uh, did, like the hard fork. Uh, we will stay in the more uh, technical side. So here we have uh, a simple DAO contract which has uh, uh, three functions and uh, one variable. So this variable is a mapping. It's like a hash table, lookup table, uh, whatever, which has uh, an address and a uint. So the address uh, is the address of the user, and the uint is the, uh, the balance of the user. So the first function is donate, uh, donate gets uh, an address, and, uh, and take the, uh, the money from the transaction. Here we can see that it's uh, payable. And add this amount of Ether to the uh, credit of this address. The second function is withdraw, uh, which gets uh, an amount and check if uh, the user had an enough uh, balance. And if he does, this function sends this amount to, to the others who invoked the function, and then remove the amount of Ether from his credit. And the last function is query credit, which uh, just return the credit of, uh, of some address. So, here is a, a contract Mallory, uh, which is very similar to the uh, contract that's actually used by the attacker of the real DAO. And um, in, uh, in contract Mallory, we declared an instance of type uh, simple DAO with, uh, with simple DAO address. And we declare an owner, and the owner uh, is the, uh, the address of the person who deployed the contract, and this is defining the constructor. And uh, we have two functions, get jackpot, which just send uh, all the balance of the contract to the owner, and the default function, which try to withdraw the amount of uh, balance that this address has in a simple DAO contract. So let's see what we need to do in order to steal money. First of all, we need to, uh, yeah. We, we, you talked about the function withdraw, withdraw where? Withdraw where? Withdraw is just uh, the name of, uh, of the function in simple DAO. Yeah. And you just invoke this function. Okay. So uh, let, let's go back and see the, uh, the withdraw function. So withdraw function gets an amount, and it, use, uh, it uses the message sender, which is the address of the uh, wallet or contract that invoked this function, and send this amount of Ether or Ray to this address. OK? Uh, so uh, all we need to do is to uh, invoke the donate function with Mallory address. So let's say we uh, donate one way, okay, to the credit of Mallory address. And then we need to invoke the default function in Mallory. And the result is that we, at, at the first, we, uh, we will try to withdraw uh, the, the amount that we, that we just donated. So this is one way. And we will enter the withdraw function and uh, we will check the, uh, the balance of Mallory. And yes, one way is larger or equal to one way. 
So we will enter the, the if statement and we will use the call function in order to transfer one way to Metary. And because Metary is a contract which has uh, a default function, we will invoke this default function. Just a second. We will invoke this default function and we will query the credit, which is still one because we, we didn't uh, remove the amount from the credit. And we will call again to withdraw with one way. And again, we will enter the if statement and send one way. Yeah, uh, we have message, a question. Message.sender.call.value amount open close there. Yeah. If Mallory was a wallet and not a contract, that yeah. would work, yes? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, this is a good question. And, uh, and this attack uses the uh, vulnerability of uh, call to the unknown, as you just said, because uh, if we knew that the uh, address of the sender is a wallet, nothing will happen. We, we will have no default function to invoke, and the re-entrancy vulnerability will not happen. All right, and so as I just said, uh, this is the way that uh, the real attacker uh, used in order to steal Ether from the DAO contract. And uh, now we will see uh, another way to steal, a more elegant way uh, to exploit the DAO. Uh, yeah. I can't hear you. The solution again is to say dot transfer instead of dot uh, call dot value. Yeah. So th there are two solutions. The first one is to use a uh, transfer. So you can we can use uh, message sender dot transfer uh, with the amount, and then we will have no uh, reentrancy uh, because we will not invoke the uh, the default function. And the second uh, solution is to uh, swap the swap the uh, uh, the order of the lines. So if we will first uh, decrease the amount from the credit and then invoke the uh, the default function, then nothing will happen because uh, we will use query credit, which will return zero, and uh, this will fix this issue. So uh, this is the uh, the second the second way to exploit the simple DAO. Uh, this is a much more elegant way. Uh, so let's uh, let's take a look. So uh, simple DAO uh, stays the same, and we uh, deployed a new contract, uh, Metary2. Uh, and here we have another uh, variable called perform attack. It's a Boolean variable, and we will set it to true. As before, we have uh, a constructor which uh, defined the owner to be the one who deployed the contract. And we have uh, a default. Uh, we have uh, a function called attack, which uh, calls uh, the DAO donate with one way, and after that, try to withdraw one way. In addition, we have uh, a default function, which uh, check if perform attack is uh, true, and if it is, it immediately uh, change the value to false and call uh, withdraw with, with, one, with one way. Does anyone here know uh, how to use Mallory 2 in order to exploit the DAO contract? I will give you a hint. Uh, the hint is that the mapping is from address to uint. uint is unsigned int. We give you more ten seconds. All right. So uh, all we have to do is to invoke uh, Metary two attack function, and when we do it, we will donate one way to Metary two. And then we will try to uh, withdraw one way. And as a result, we will enter the default function, as we saw before. And because perform attack is still true, 
we will change perform attack to be false and we will try to withdraw one more way. So if we do that, we will decrease the uh, credit uh, of memory 2 from 1 to minus 1. But we don't have mi one, uh, minus 1 because this is a uint. So we will have underflow. As a result, uh, the credit of memory 2 will be uh, the maximum value of uint. After that, we will just use the get jackpot function and withdraw the, all the DAO balance because the DAO balance is less than infinity. All right? Great. Okay, the, uh, the next uh, attack is the king of the ether throne. Uh, this is a game. Uh, this is a, a classic uh, a pyramid, pyramid, pyramid scheme. And uh, uh, here, just a second. Uh, in this game, uh, we have one king at a time. And in order to replace the king, we need to, uh, to pay, to compensate uh, the current king with an amount that's, la uh, that's larger than the amount that the current king paid before. So le let's take a look. Uh, we have uh, an address of the current king. We have a variable which is the claim price, which will be uh, 100 by default. And uh, we have uh, a default function, which will be invoked when we send ether to this contract. And this default function will check if the uh, message value, which is the amount of ether that was sent uh, in this transaction, is less than the claim price. If so, we will throw, we will throw an arrow. If not, we will calculate a new compensation and we will try to send the new compensation to the current king. If we will get an error from this uh, send function, we will throw an error. Otherwise, we will replace the king with the address of the uh, sender, and uh, we will calculate a new price for the claim price. All right. So uh, an another interesting thing that the, the last king um, will get a nice bonus at the end. So we can declare uh, a time which uh, at this specific time the game will end. And uh, the, the king that is uh, uh, actually the, the last king uh, will get the, uh, the compensation. So. Here we see uh, a contract memory, again, uh, which uh, exploit the uh, king of the, of the ether to one. So um, our incentive is to wait as long as possible. That's the, uh, the claim price will be uh, large enough. So uh, uh, there, there are a lot of money in the contract. And then we will deploy a memory contract, which, uh, which has uh, two functions. The first one is unseat king, and the second is a default function, which always return error. And when we call unseat king, we will just call the, uh, the king contract with some amount of ether. Let's say this ether is larger than the claimed price. So we will replace the current king, and from now on, from now on, no one can uh, unseat uh, Mallory. So Mallory stays the king forever. Why is that? Because we have a default function which always always return error, and uh, as we see, if the king dot send uh, function raise an error we will revert everything and the king will not uh, change. 
All right. Uh, odds and evens. Uh, this is a stupid game. Uh, and here we have uh, an array of players. Uh, when player uh, is uh, uh, an object which has address and uh, a number. And in this game, uh, each player needs to uh, choose a number. And when we have two players, we compensate uh, the winner, and the winner is uh, uh, we we calculate the winner by uh, sum the two numbers, and if the sum is uh, even, then the the first player uh, win. If it's odd, then the second player wins. So le let's take a look at the uh, at the code. So uh, we have a function play which receive uh, a number, and this is a payable. And we check if the message value is uh, ether, because this is the, the price of the game. And uh, if it's uh, eth if it, uh, ether, one ether, we will add uh, to the player's array the new player object, which, are, which uh, has his address and yeah, his number that he just uh, chose. And we will wait when we have two players. And we, when we have two players, we will call the and the winner is function. And the winner is function uh, uh, calculate the sum of the two numbers and check if it's uh, even or odd. And if uh, the sum is even, we will send uh, some amount of ether uh, to the first player. If it's odd, we will send the same amount of ether to the second player. So does then anyone here see the problem? Yeah. Again? No exactly. Yeah. As we as we saw before, uh, there are no secrets in the blockchain in Ethereum. And uh, although we declare the player's array to be private, it doesn't mean that uh, one can calculate by himself and see the last transaction and uh, pick a number to, uh, to make him win. OK, so Rubixi. Uh, Rubixi is uh, an interesting uh, project. And the original name was Dynamic Pyramid. Uh, this is a real project, yeah. Uh, again? Yeah. What do you mean? Front running in decentralized exchanges means that you can see the last order put in the order. If the order book is on, on chain, mm -hmm. you can see that a transaction which is in the mempool that hasn't entered, uh, that hasn't entered uh, a block yet, mm -hmm. you can tell that it's in the mempool and then you can front run it and put your own order. I think that you cannot do in yeah. a centralized exchange. It's pretty much similar yeah, to this is the same. Okay. There, there are no secrets. If you uh, uh, if you send a transaction, then anyone can see it. It's on the blockchain. Okay, thanks. All right. So uh, Rubixi uh, uh, has uh, a different name. The original name was uh, Dynamic uh, Pyramid. Uh, not a very good name. So uh, they decided to change the name of the project, and and they also changed the uh, the name of the contract. However, they didn't change the name of the constructor. So the constructor uh, can only be uh, called once when the contract deployed. And here, uh, we have no constructor. We just have a function uh, which anyone can call and change the owner to be himself. This is really uh, funny and... Uh, this is why it's dynamic. <laughs> exactly. All right, so the, the last thing is the dynamic libraries. 
So in Ethereum, we have uh, also libraries, which are spatial contracts. And those contracts, uh, those libraries, cannot have uh, immutable fields. And direct, direct call to functions on the library done via the delegate call. So uh, let's see the problem here. Let's say I have a library. And uh, I have a library uh, version 1.0. And I have uh, some consumers, some uh, smart contracts who uh, use, the, use my uh, library. And then I discover the bug, or I want to change a little bit my contract, my uh, library. Then I have to deploy a new library with a new address and tell all of my consumers, all the smart contracts, to also change their pointers to point to the new library. This is a real problem. And the solution is to have uh, a special contract which holds uh, the current library address. So if I will change, if I will, if I will change, uh, uh, if I will deploy a new library, all I need to do is to change it in my special contract to point to the new version. And then all of my consumers will get uh, the updated address from this special contract. So uh, let's see the problem here. So let's say I have uh, a library called set, which has uh, a function uh, version, uh, which retur return one. And I have the uh, set provider. This is the spatial smart contract to hold the updated uh, address of my library. And uh, we have the up update lib function uh, that's, have, uh, uh, that's get an address and update the uh, set lib address. We also have uh, a get function which returns the updated uh, address of the library. And here we have uh, Bob, a contract to Bob, which uh, used the uh, set provider and uh, he, he declares the set provider with the uh, address of set provider. And when he tries to, uh, when we try to invoke the get version of Bob, get ver, uh, we will uh, fetch the updated version of, how, of my library from the set provider and try to invoke the, uh, the, version, the version function. And now let's see the problem here. Um, let's say that I am the owner of the set provider smart contract. And uh, I deployed a new library. And this new library changed the implementation of version. And instead of return one, we add one more line. And this line uh, call attacker, which is my address and send uh, this dot balance amount of ether. So uh, the this variable is belong to the colli because when we invoke functions on uh, libraries, by default we will use delegate call. So after we I will uh, deploy the malicious set and change. Uh, with update lib function, the pointer uh, of the library to point to a uh, malicious set, and someone will try to call uh, Bob's get version function. All the money of Bob will be transferred to the attacker. Yes. How can you deploy it? Can you repeat? How can you replace Bob's provider? Can you do it? How can I replace? No, I, I didn't replace the provider. I'm using a provider which holds uh, the updated uh, uh, address of my library. So Bob, uh, Bob's contract uh, didn't change. 
Okay. He just Bob, Bob contracts need to point to your new malicious set. Uh, no, Bob points Otherwise. to the set provider smart contract. Right? He declares uh, a set uh, a set provider instance, and this set provider is a smart contract. Okay, so so the set provider needs to points to your uh, exactly uh, exactly how you do that. Uh, okay, so uh, we uh, use the update lib function because I'm the owner uh, of set provider uh, smart contract. Then I can invoke this function and tell the uh, set provider contract to point to the newer version of the library, to the malicious set library. What you're saying that if you are allowed to update your library, you can attack your users. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, and the way to mitigate it is to have your own uh, provider. If the set provider was uh, Bob's contract, then no one, uh, no one else than Bob uh, could change the uh, set lib address. And this is the preferred way to use libraries. Yes. In set provider, we say if message sender is owner, uh, yeah. But we don't, we don't have a constructor, and before we've had constructors where we set the owner based on who run the constructor, we're yeah. just assuming that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, assume that we have a constructor which uh, define exactly this. All right, uh, so this is basically it. Thank you. Hi. Any questions? Yeah. You said that your your company is you aim to uh, service uh, DApps. Exactly. So how would you facilitate uh, risk management with all the vulnerabilities that you just mentioned? Okay, good question. Uh, so uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so uh, Portis. Uh, uh, as I just uh, said uh, at the start of the of my talk, uh, is a platform which enables uh, an easier way to interact with decentralized applications. So we we don't uh, write our own applications, and all of the uh, vulnerabilities and exploits we just saw uh, rely on the uh, on the smart contracts on on those uh, decentralized applications. So we have nothing to do with that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't say you you have anything to do with it, but yeah. if you are in this ecosystem and mm -hmm. you run a platform on top of which other people would write their smart contracts, how would you deal with the risk management? Because what you just described is something that is inherently problematic. Uh, this is right. Smart contracts that are public and uh, anybody could, you know, inspect it and then find a way uh, in which to, to attack. It. Yeah. And um, a Turing complete system that uh, allows any soft, any software, any smart contract to run you know, to till infinity. So, how would you, if this is what what you're doing, how yeah. would you deal with it? So, uh, I don't have to deal with it, but uh, I would recommend to uh, either go to an expert, uh, which do uh, anal analyze analysis, um, and uh, check your uh, contract, and see if you have uh, vulnerabilities in your smart contract. Or you can also use uh, a tool called Oyent, which is an uh, open source uh, tool from the academia. And, uh, and these tools, uh, this tool try to do a static analysis on smart contracts. Uh, and I wouldn't rely only on this tool. If you have uh, a, a real decentralized application, with some amount of uh, money, I would go to an expert 
which uh, validate your code, as you do with uh, centralized application applications as well. There's a big difference because, you know, any centralized software, there's always a shutdown button. If, you know, if I take any software and run any an, any type of analysis, there's always a chance that someone something was left unnoticed, and I can I can take that risk uh, if if that smart contract holds a, a significant funds. So there has to be something you know inherent that would deal with the, that uh, risk, or otherwise, would you say? nothing significant can be totally uh, decentralized. You know, uh, it to totally decentralized in, in a smart contract. Yeah, so you can... I, I'm asking your opinion. Yeah, yeah, of course. So you can always have a function which uh, terminates the, uh, the contract. Uh, and actually, we have a special uh, method, uh, kill, which kill the, the contract. So there is a, a shutdown button for uh, smart contracts. But yeah, this is a, a real problem, and uh, and a lot of people investigating how to deal with it. Yeah. So an address and a contract uh, are similar. There's no way to distinguish the two. Uh, yeah. So th there is a way, uh, but if I would just show you two addresses without a computer, you cannot uh, distinguish. Uh, which is an address and which is a smart contract. But in, uh, in smart contract, in Solidity, and even uh, uh, from uh, an Ethereum uh, node, like a GET or Parity, we can ask the, uh, uh, the network to get the code of this address. And if we get zero, then this is a wallet. Is it by design? Yeah. Why? We, we need to ask Vitalik. No, <laughs> really, what's the reason uh, I, that I they don't keep it like that? Yeah, I, I don't have a good question. Obviously, good the, the easiest way to avoid such uh, malleability is, is, is to change the address format, to distinguish the two, without, yeah. without uh, what you mentioned. Yeah, but then, then you will have uh, different problems. So uh, th this is how they designed the, the language. Thanks. I promise everyone I'm not shilling. Uh, you said you, your company is making accessing decentralized apps easier. Right. How does that work? I'm trying to, if I'm trying to write my, my first decentralized mm -hmm. app, let's say Ether Chess, how would I use your product? Okay, great. So you go, uh, you go into our website, uh, you install our SDK, uh, which is uh, completely uh, JavaScript based. And you enter three lines of code. And uh, from then on, your users, the users of your uh, decentralized application, will, will have uh, a, a really easy interface to use your, uh, your DAP, your DApp. So basically, you, your SDK provides my front-end application uh, basically calling the functions from a contract. Yeah, so you don't have to change anything in your code. Actually, I can show you a demo if you want. Okay. That would be uh, So you, you don't have to change anything in, in your code. Uh, we are Web3 compliant. Uh, I don't know what that is, but it sounds good. Yeah. This will be better. Uh, so this is a, a simple uh, a decentralized ap application. And when I click on create, I try to uh, send a transaction to the Ethereum network. And when I will do it, we will see the Portis uh, pop up. Uh, and when I will enter uh, my username and password, uh, we will see a really easy and convenient way to uh, approve, to confirm, confirm this transaction. And we can also t see the, the total amount of, uh, of dollars 
that uh, this transaction will cost us. And this is uh, only for gas fees. And when I will click confirm, this transaction uh, just uh, go to the Ethereum network and we have a confirmation. So th this is the, the interface, uh, really easy and familiar. Uh, no, uh, no, has no private keys or wallets. Uh, th there are private keys and wallets, but the user uh, doesn't have to know about it. And uh, the technical integration is really easy. Just three, three lines of code. Interesting. Hey. Could you emphasize uh, some uh, companies that run by DAO, maybe Fat3, that uh, run uh, successfully now on this stage? By DAO? Yes. What do you mean by DAO? Uh, some governance of uh, some organization, the, the not maybe blockchain organization, but just the do, do governance by, by DAO structure. Yeah. So do you mean like an example to decentralized application? Community. Community, some community that run by DAO. And it's successful now. Is it exist yeah. or F3? Yeah. So uh, I will show you an example. This is one of uh, our client. Uh, Spring. Whoa. And this is not hackable. It's just still. Uh, sorry? But it's not. Uh, the code, it's uh, uh, not hackable. Yeah. Uh, still, yeah. Still, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Spring Wall which is currently on beta, is, uh, uh, let's see, continue with Portis. I will sign in with my uh, Portis account. And, uh, and Springle is uh, like uh, LinkedIn on the blockchain. So uh, anyone can uh, verify uh, anyone, anyone else history, uh, and uh, there are also uh, there is also a concept of of verification. So uh, you, uh, I say that I am the CTO of Portis, and if we will search for Portis, I don't remember how to do it. We can see uh, our advisors and the the green uh, check uh, on the Avishai uh, picture uh, means that uh, the Portis uh, manager actually approved that Avishai is an advisor of Portis. So uh, right now in LinkedIn, anyone can go and write that uh, he worked at uh, Google and uh, and Vitalik is uh, is advisor in uh, in his new company, right? So here we can verify all of that information with the uh, with the blockchain because everyone has a unique private key. So this is uh, an example of decentralized application. No. Uh, good question. Portis, uh, unlike all the other solutions out there, is not an extension, and uh, the user doesn't have to install anything. So this is an iPhone. Exactly. So this is a vulnerability. How so? This is a vulnerability because I can write another app, call it yuki.com, mm -hmm. and make my UI look the same as yours and steal your password. Yeah, so this is a, fi a phishing attack. Yeah, and we have a mechanism uh, to, uh, uh, to reduce uh, the, the phishing attacks. And uh, as you said, this is uh, an iframe. And uh, in our, next, in our uh, next release, the sign-in flow will be from a new tab like uh, like Facebook uh, single sign-on. It must so, be. Yeah. And you must have the header so you won't have exactly. iPhone enabled at all. Sorry? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> More questions? Yes. Uh, regarding the 
what you mentioned that uh, the bugs are irreplaceable because the contracts are fixed. Yeah, immutable. So, yeah, the contracts, once deployed, they have an address and they are immutable. So what is uh, like the recommended way to address it? I mean, kind of proxy contract or uh, whatever? Uh, yeah, so proxy contract is, uh, is a good way to mitigate it. Uh, but also in, uh, in proxy contract, you can have bugs and vulnerabilities. And, uh, and this is uh, related to the previous question on how to uh, mitigate uh, vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities on smart contracts. So uh, again, you need to, to talk with, uh, with an expert to check your uh, contract. And in addition to have uh, some kind of uh, a kill function, which terminates the, uh, the smart contract if a vulnerability uh, was discovered. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Itai. Uh, the uh, lecture and other materials will be posted on our blog a uh, couple in a couple of days. Uh, there are still uh, pizzas uh, you are welcome to take, and our next session is going to take place in August, mid-August, and we are going to talk about stellar architecture. So thank you for joining us. Good night.